Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Winter weather is here already and that means the needs of animals are changing just like the temperatures. We begin today with advice for helping horses through these cold days and nights. Here's our OSU Extension equine specialist, Dr. Chris Heine. So if we have sudden changes in temperature, that actually can be a little bit harder on animals than when it just gradually gets a bit colder. So making sure that the animal has essentially had time to acclimate, has grown a winter hair coat is important. Otherwise, we probably need to help support them with blanketing or at least making sure they have adequate shelter. So a shed that is uh, positioned to essentially block the north wind and again, get them out of that cold, bitter rain with wind is the key for them to being able to handle those cold temperatures. People always want to know, should they blanket their horse or not? Uh, and you have to think about, you know, if you put that blanket on and it's not waterproof, uh, you're going to do more harm than good if it uh, changes to rain. Uh, not taking the blanket off to see what the horse looks like under there and just really not paying attention to them during the winter because we're uncomfortable and we don't want to spend as much time outside. In addition, with cold temperatures, if the water freezes, the horse doesn't have access to that. So we typically see an increase in uh, colic due to dehydration impactions in the winter. And that is largely preventable if we make sure we have an open source of water for them. So we either have to have heated tanks or bring warm water or continually bust open the ice off the tanks to make sure the horse has water. In addition, horses actually prefer lukewarm water over icy cold water. So if they only have icy cold water, sometimes they'll drop their water intake due to that. Colic can be um, mild uh, from a horse that you notice that he hasn't picked up or eaten all of his grain, any feed refusals. I certainly really pay attention if a horse isn't eating normally um, to a horse that's a little crampy. Um, so they may be wanting to roll looking at their sides, pawing, just showing signs of discomfort. To a horse that is in severe pain, will be uh, rolling violently, uh, maybe sweating uh, profusely. So it can range from essentially what you'd see with mild discomfort all the way up to extreme pain. In the winter, a couple things come to mind with hoof care. One is if we have these ups and downs of temperature and we have rain at the same time and the water isn't able to soak down into the ground, mud, um, a lot of mud being around can be really hard on their hooves. So they will um, can get thrush and abscesses from the weakened hoof wall. The other possibility is with really hard frozen ground. If it's really rough, um, really hard frozen ruts and things like that, um, they may be more susceptible to bruising or um, just kind of some injuries relative to those conditions. So in general, there's not as much problems in the winter because theoretically it's dry and cold. But if we have weird winters with a lot of mud or rain, then, then it can be a problem. When people think of habitat management for white-tailed deer, they're often thinking about food resources and they'll often neglect the cover needs of deer. Cover is important for several different reasons. They use it both to stay cool or warm in inclement weather, but a big reason they use cover is just for security, um, to stay hidden and to not feel pressured from predation, especially from the uh, human presence that might be on a property. So a lot of Forested properties in the eastern part of the state 
have a really open understory. The, the canopy's closed and there's really not a, a developed shrub layer. And in these forests, cover can often be very limited. And especially on smaller properties, this can have big implications on how many deer actually stay on your property. So if you're trying to keep more deer on the property, like during hunting season, you need to really think about cover and where it occurs on, across your property. If you don't have it, you can easily create it. Um, the first thing you need to do is just to make forested openings, like the one behind me. We've went into a, an area that was mostly eastern red cedar and we just simply cut them all down, allowed sunlight to come into that area, and we got an abundant amount of uh, tall grasses that actually provide cover, particularly during the summer. And around the edge, we've fallen a lot of trees and we, instead of piling those up and burning them, we've left those treetops and those treetops actually serve as cover for white-tailed deer. So you can use herbicide or mechanical means to, to create these forested openings. Um, a simple way is just to take a chainsaw and, and cut these trees off at three to four foot height. Uh, what we want to do is what's called a hinge cut. Now on this tree, I didn't do a hinge cut. Just to illustrate <clears throat> the difference, I actually took a notch out and then just cut the tree. And of course it breaks cleanly like we typically cut a tree and then this falls off. So it, it does provide cover, uh, but not as much as if we cut the tree on a hinge. So compare that last cut to this hinge cut where I did not take a notch out of the, the front side of the tree where it's gonna fall. I just cut through the tree until it pivoted over. And so now the tree stays connected to this uh, stem and it's gonna stay off the ground and provide a little bit more cover that deer can back into, especially with the cedar like this that has a lot of limbs and the needles, which will stay on here for a little while. It provides really good thermal cover for, for white-tailed deer and, and, and also helps them feel secure on the property. Now, we can also do this to trees that actually can provide not only cover, but also food. This is an American elm, also hinged, and oftentimes when there's some of this cambium still left attached, this tree will stay alive for maybe a couple of years. And not only is it providing the cover now, but the deer will actually uh, browse on the leaves that are now made available on this tree. And the tree will continue to put leaves out for some time. So it's also providing some food resources um, for white-tailed deer. So think about the cover resources you have on your property and the different ways that you can use uh, to create additional cover resources, whether it be mechanical like hinge cutting or herbicide, and then you can follow up with prescribed fire to help keep those areas open and dense and shrubby long term. And I think these tips will help you keep more deer on your property and help those deer really feel secure. Wholesale box beef sharply increased recently. So Daryl, is this price movement you know, typical for this time of year? Well, it's not unusual to see some increase in the overall box beef uh, in, in, the, in you know, the beginning of the, the uh, fourth quarter. However, it's been more pronounced than usual this year uh, with a sharp increase in, uh, in, in a little bit earlier than usual. Is this a matter of demand or supply? Well, it's, it's both, of course. Prices are determined by both supply and demand, but it really is, is both. Uh, seasonally, we've got some, some beef products uh, have a sharp, you know, have an increase in demand this time of the year. And we normally see, you know, beef prices or beef production, excuse me, drop a little bit uh, in the fall of the year. Yearling slaughter is a little bit smaller. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's a combination of both of those factors. So the, the choice between, uh, uh, or the spread between choice and box beef has been pretty wide is, you know, what's driving that pattern? We've seen an unusual choice select spread since mid-year uh, this year. Um, and I think, again, that's a combination of supply and demand. When we talk about beef products, of course, it's specific products and specific qualities. And so one of the things that happened this summer was we had uh, some problems uh, that show up in the data with uh, feedlot performance. Uh, basically, the grading percentage dropped a little bit, so we had relatively less choice, more select in the market. That tends to widen the spread. And again, we've had very solid demand for 
for particularly the, the high quality choice products this year. So that's tended to keep the spread wider than usual. Oh, well, you mentioned those choice products. What particular type of products are actually, you know, driving that demand? Well, okay, so, you know, beef is a lot of different things. So when we talk about the boxed beef market going up, you have to look at specific products. And so, uh, you know, one of the most pronounced things this time of the year is we normally see ribs really get uh, pricey during the, the uh, you know, we, we, the price goes up in November because we're buying a prime rib basically for the Christmas and New Year's holiday period. This year, that process started earlier than usual. So we saw them really shoot up in, in, uh, in October, uh, even earlier than usual. On the uh, you know loin products, it's kind of a mixed bag, and so um, you know tenderloins get more expensive this time of the year, and we've seen a, a dramatic increase in tenderloin prices uh, as restaurant uh, you know uh, business picks up in the cooler weather of the year. Uh, but uh, strip loins, for example, are a very popular grilling item and they tend to be weaker in the fall of the year. They come out of a high summer period. And of course, loins overall are a little bit weaker this time of the year simply because strip loins amount for a, a bigger percentage of the, uh, of the loin primal than uh, tenderloins do. So it, it's always a mixed bag. You have to look at specific products. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. So. <laughs> <laughs> it makes right. you hungry, doesn't it? All right, thanks, Daryl. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. As we go into the late fall, early winter months, it's not too early to begin thinking about the spring calving season because now is a good time to do the preparations that can really help us ensure a, a successful spring calving season. This would be a good time, I think, to walk through our calving pens, uh, the, the areas where we might want to bring a heifer up if she's needing some assistance during calving, and make sure that all the gates are working, that the squeeze area that we're going to put her in is functional, dry, clean, and ready to go. If you're like uh, we were uh, when I was growing up as a kid in Nebraska, we often would find that when that first heifer needed help, the calving area, the calving stall in the barn that we used, was still full of such things as steel posts, barbed wire, grass seed, maybe some motor oil. All those things had to be cleaned out and moved before we could actually use the calving stall. Well, now would be a good time to get that particular chore done so that we're not worrying about it in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter, when that first heifer needs some help. Also, think back to last year. Did you have some real problems with calf diarrhea in your herd? Well, now would be a good time, I think, to try to make some preparations to head off that problem for this year. First of all, if you're going to calve in the same uh, area, can you consider moving to a different calving pasture or lot that's still close to the, the headquarters where you can watch the heifers and cows that uh, may need some assistance, but move into a different area that uh, may not have those same pathogens in the ground that were held over from last year. And if you had some real uh, calf diarrhea issues, now I think would be a good time to talk to your local veterinarian about the possibility of giving the cows, the pregnant cows, a, uh, a scour's vaccine, one that uh, you give to the cows so that they impart more of the anti-diarrhea -di antibodies in that first milk or colostrum after those calves are born. We can do a few things right now to get ready for that spring calving season, perhaps save just a few more calves and help our bottom line the following year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow Calf Corner. We are here now with Jeff Roby, the new program coordinator for OQBN. Jeff, welcome to Oklahoma State. Thank you, it's good to be here. Let's remind our viewers what OQBN is and kind of what's happening this time of year. Okay, sure. Uh, OQBN stands for Oklahoma Quality Beef Network. Uh, it's a joint program between the Oklahoma Extension Service and the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association. And it's, a, it's an effort to add value to producers, cattle, that they are uh, through preconditioning pre methods um, and produce healthier, heavier cattle for the state of Oklahoma. 
And this time of year, you and the team are, are pretty busy with those fall sales. Tell us how all of that is Absolutely. going. Absolutely. Uh, we're in full swing right now. We're about halfway through the selling season. Uh, we've got several more coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've got Blackwell. Uh, it's probably our largest enrollment right now, so we're really excited about that one. Uh, and we've got several more coming up down in uh, El Reno at OKC West. Now, I know the data kind of is, is coming in throughout this time, but any, any early indications of how things are looking this year? Things are looking good. Uh, some may say it's a little bit of a down market right now. That depends who you talk to, I guess. Uh, but those producers that are participating in the program are seeing, once again, they're seeing premiums over non-preconditioned calves, and they're looking uh, pretty good. Great. Uh, for folks who are enrolled in the program and haven't yet weaned their cattle, there is still there is still a window, right? Tell us about that. There is still a window. There's a small window. Um, we have changed things a little bit as far as how we um, set up the sales. This year at OKC West, we switched to weekly sales down there, uh, and that runs through January 14th. So if you've got some calves you've been thinking about, maybe selling, getting into the program, uh, you still have time to do that. Uh, that weaning date's coming up pretty fast though. It's gonna be around December 1st to get your calves in by that January 14th date though. Okay, Jeff, nice to meet you. Thanks for the information and we will see you again soon. Thank you. For more information on the sales that are upcoming and the OQBN program in general, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. Wes Lee discussing another cold week on the Mesonet Weather Report. Temperatures continued to remain frigid this past week as another extremely strong cold front moved through the state. On Tuesday morning, there wasn't a 30 degree temperature recorded in the state and only two low 20s in Idabel and Broken Bow. Single digits and even negative numbers were common in the Northwest. The negative four at Eva was one of the coldest days ever recorded in November. This front shattered the coolest temperature records for this day in about 75% of the counties. Wind chills with this front made it feel even colder. The highest wind chill recorded was 13 at Broken Bow and the lowest a negative 17 in Eva. The temperatures have been below average now for quite a while. This chart shows the statewide average temps over the past few weeks starting from the 12th. The blue lines are the 15 year average for each day while the orange lines are the actual temperatures. Only three of these days reached the expected average number. November the 12th was about 25 degrees below normal. The good news for the state is next week's air temperatures are expected to finally get back to normal and may even be above normal in the western two-thirds of the state. Gary is up next showing the prospects for rain in the forecast. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well, we thought it was cold the previous few weeks, but wow, this week winter really struck us hard. Now, I'm not sure we really need uh, no January weather during November, but it did help keep those drought concerns down. Let's get straight to the new drought monitor map and see what we have. Well, in reality, we have the same basic pattern. We have the moderate to severe drought down across southwest Oklahoma. It's really confined to the southwestern quarter of the state now. And then we have a drought out in the western panhandle with some abnormally dry conditions surrounding both the areas uh, that are indicative of possible drought development uh, in the future if we don't get some uh, appreciable rainfall or moisture in those areas. Now speaking of moisture, if we look at the last 30 days, we do see that we have gotten significantly drier over western Oklahoma and also up into north central Oklahoma with central Oklahoma through the eastern sides of the state really getting some pretty good moisture. Uh, less than an inch and in some cases no rainfall over the last 30 days out through the panhandle and generally less than an inch or two out across the western third of the state and up into north central Oklahoma. 
Now, if you look at that as compared to uh, the percent of normal, uh, we see again in the panhandle uh, from 25% uh, of normal over the last 30 days to less than that. But it does show we need that moisture across western Oklahoma, and perhaps next week, as we get into later next week, we'll start to see some of that greatly increased odds of above normal precipitation across the western two-thirds of the state, but especially across the western panhandle. As I said, the cooler weather helps uh, ease those drought woes. Uh, we can still get drought developed though, even if it's cold outside. Um, so we do need that moisture and we'll keep an eye on that for next week. So we'll see you next week on the Mesonet Weather Report. Reuters was reporting earlier this week that Brazil was muscling in on some of the U.S. commodities. Kim, is there much truth to that? Oh yeah, it's definitely true. You look at uh, the corn market right now, Brazil's been taking those exports, Argentina to a certain degree. Uh, you look, uh, three out of the last four years, uh, Brazil's had a record corn crop in that third year that wasn't a record, was a near record. You go back 20 years, that'd be the 99-2000 marking year. Brazil exported essentially 0% of the world's corn exports. This year they're exporting 22%. Now we mentioned uh, Argentina over that same period, they went from 2% to 20%. So we've seen those South American countries come in and take U.S. corn exports. And the degree of that is U.S. exports in that 20 year period of percentage of the world has went from 65% down to 29%. Overall, if we look back even further, have we have we seen this before? Oh yeah, we've seen it before. We saw it in, with Brazil and soybeans. You can go back to the uh, t 19, late 1970s, 1980s. Brazil started their soybean production. Uh, Japan, China started going to Brazil relative to the United States. And you look at uh, their production, you know, about their exports four years ago surpassed U.S. export uh, markets, and now they're exporting 36% more soybeans in the world export market than we are. Uh, you look at uh, the Black Sea, what's going on in the Black Sea with wheat in the last, oh, 15, 20 years again, really starting about 2007, uh, Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan, they, they export 37% of the world's exports now, and you go back 25, 30 years, they were exporting near zero. Actually, you go back to the 70s and 80s, they were importing, importing wheat. So we've seen it happen in wheat, in the, in the Black Sea countries, we've seen the South American countries come in and take our corn and soybeans. What's changed in the last 15 years that, that spurred this to happen? Well, we just got economic development in those countries. Uh, those countries opened up. They opened up those markets for exports. You know, Argentina a couple years ago took that export tax off of their agricultural products where they were, you know, they had a 30, 35 percent export tax on wheat, corn, uh, beans. They removed that plus the production. You've had technology moving there and investment moving in those countries, even in the Black Sea area. You've had outside investment come in. They've improved their and continue to improve their infrastructure so they can, they can not only produce it, they can get it to that export market. What does all this mean for the U.S. producers? Well, we've got more competition. And when you've got more competition, what you have to do is you have to be efficient, you have to lower your cost, and you have to pr produce a high quality product that will, that will compete on the world market. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Since it's a little bit cold outside, I thought that I would share a little bit of information about coffee. Coffee originated in Ethiopia, but the exact circumstances that resulted in its discovery are unknown. Historians suggest that coffee spread from Ethiopia through trade with Arab merchants. And by the end of the 15th century, coffee had been introduced to Persia, Egypt, Turkey, and North Africa. Coffee became so popular and such a lucrative commodity that the Turkish Empire forbade the selling of viable beans, only beans that had either been boiled in water 
or partially roasted to prevent germination could be traded. The two main types of coffee plants used for commercial production today are Arabica and Robusta. Arabica produces a coffee that is higher in quality. However, it grows at an altitude between 3,000 and 6,000 feet and develops slowly. Robusta produces a lower quality coffee that has a harsher flavor. However, it grows at lower altitudes, is more disease resistant, and also produces higher yields. The distinct aroma and flavor of coffee also develop through the roasting process. A combination of aroma, appearance, temperature, and sound is used to determine the type and degree of roast. Light roast coffee beans have an orange-brown color, non-oily surface, and mild flavor. Medium roast coffee beans have a medium brown color, a non-oily surface, and stronger flavor. This also happens to be the type of roast that is generally preferred in the United States. Medium dark roast coffee beans have a rich, dark color with some oil on the surface and a strong flavor with a slightly bitter aftertaste. Dark roast coffee beans have a very dark, almost black color and have a very shiny, oily surface and very strong, distinct, bitter flavor. The rich, hearty taste of coffee has helped maintain its popularity all the way from ancient Ethiopia to your cup today. For more information, please visit sunup.okstate.edu or fapc.biz. That does it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website, sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.